get rid of swarms of starfighters with this one easy trick. What's up, meta nerds? This video is going to explore flak guns in the Star Wars universe. They do exist, even though we don't see them as often as you'd think. We'll explore how the real world flak works, why it is way more effective in space, and how it was used throughout the Clone Wars and Galactic Civil War era. For this, we're going to utilize many canon and legend sources, which are all linked down in the description. But let's start with what flak is. Well, the word actually comes from this German word, which you can have fun pronouncing. Probably the most well-known was the German 88mm, which is actually where you get the phrase Akak gun, an Americanization of the German word for 8, with the gun being called the Aktakt. Simply put, it fires a shell that has a timed fuse, which allows it to explode at a certain point in the air. Others use barometric fuses, detonating when they reach a certain altitude, and then there are even proximity fuses. There are different variants like the VT, but there are even some with tiny radars in them that worked by sending out a ping, and if that ping bounced back, then boom. This would have to be very close, and though you might think since that is the most advanced version, it might be what we see in Star Wars tech. But you'll see why this might actually be the worst version to use. And then there's some variation on the actual flak explosion. Sometimes it was just incendiary, but usually it was shrapnel, being metal shards, ball bearings, or metal rails that would explode out in all directions. If we look at the guidebook Lead by Example, we get a brief explanation of Star Wars Flak firing the same kind of stuff. But what's really interesting is how advanced the target acquisition tech of World War II Flak Guns was. This is an actual Air Force training motion picture, and I highly recommend you watch the full thing, linked down below. Despite fears of copyright, or even espionage for releasing restricted War Department footage, have a listen to the level of advanced tech that was used in Flak Guns of this era. First, the aircraft is picked up in an optical sight and held on the crosshair. The sight keeps tracking it continuously, obtaining its direction and angular height while a stereoscopic rangefinder determines the altitude. At night or in bad weather, the aircraft may be tracked solely by radar. Whether tracked by optical sight or by radar, the information is fed by electric cable to a director. This mechanical quiz kid digests the data and automatically computes the right lead, setting the guns. So of course, the calculating ability of Star Wars weapons would be much more efficient. From that clip, you see that the real trick is to be able to run that calculation faster and get the flak to a higher velocity so that you can reach the target quicker. Both things that the high-tech societies of Star Wars could easily accomplish. You might think that they would definitely work in that proximity type of flak, creating a combo of perfect shot placement and perfect detonation. Or you might be wondering why this flak couldn't fire around that would get to the area, and then be able to track the ship as it moved. Something like we see with Discord missiles fired by Vulture droids during the Battle of Coruscant. Anakin is able to shake them by spinning, always a good trick, forcing the missiles to crash into each other. But with Obi-Wan, we see that, in a way, buzz droids do act like flak. Many Star Wars fans, myself included, have wondered why have buzz droids at all. But it's for the same reason that you don't want smart flak what I'll call the kind of flak shell that explodes on proximity or through some complicated tracking. Because in the Revenge of the Sith novel, as well as some other guidebooks, we see electronic countermeasures in action. This is primarily used for blocking ship-to-ship -ship communication, but is said to also be able to block a starfighter or bomber's ability to lock on, and block the signals to and from a tracking ordinance. Just as a missile was about to hit the target, it might be jammed and go awry. Admittedly, we don't really see this a lot, but then again, a lot of the deeper lore for Star Wars is ignored for plot purposes. Kinda like how almost every ship and vehicle gets taken out with a single shot, no matter the thick armor or beefy shields. But if we consider the ECM countermeasures of ships, bombers, and their support craft, then we see why designing a cloud of buzz droids to explode in front of the ship, kinda like flak, does make some more sense. And there's clips in the Clone Wars that do confirm that Discord missiles are supposed to explode in front of the enemy starfighter. And this fear of ECM jamming is why the couple paragraphs on Flak that we do get says that they quote, burst at set distances, still doing it the old timed fuse way. Ironically, they're not advanced precisely because of how much other technology has advanced. At this point in the Star Wars arms war, the ECM technology is more powerful than what you'd call smart Flak. But you can't jam a physical or chemical process inside of a Flak shell. If you look around in the background of the Battle of Coruscant, you can see tons of small flak explosions. It's spread just about everywhere, and some of them have this cool green coloring when they explode. But to see flak in more detail, we can look at a couple Clone Wars episodes. Here we see Ahsoka leading an assault involving V-19 Torrent Starfighters, 
and there are tons of flak explosions nearby, but admittedly it doesn't seem to have that much of an effect. Even though not smart flak, it is detonating seemingly nearby, so it might be surprising that it isn't super effective. Because if anything, one of the nasty advantages of flak in space is both how Star Wars shields work and the lack of resistance. In space, the shrapnel that explodes out from each of these shells will just keep on going. No air resistance to slow down the velocity. It should be just as deadly at 10 feet as it would be at a mile away. So creating an enormous cloud of shrapnel should be pretty easy. Also remember that most starfighters take an active role in directing their shields. Put your deflectors on double front. But as the pilot, you won't know where the flak is coming from. Might be in front, behind, port, or starboard. If done right, the flak should be coming from all directions. But with Ahsoka's run, the V-19s were destroyed by vulture droids, not the flak. Not by the weapon that should be even more effective in space. So what gives? Well, I think this has to do in part with the fact that the shields might be absorbing some of the shrapnel. Though solid objects should pass through most shields, but they're not always consistent on this. So really the better thing to point out is that flak was never incredibly effective at taking down aircraft. Akak -ak fanboys don't get triggered, I'll explain. Tons of research has been done on this, and both American and German manufacturers hyped up the effectiveness of flak guns, with one German manufacturer claiming that they could down an aircraft with just 50 shells. The actual research shows that it was something more like 12,000 shells for a single aircraft. But that really isn't the whole picture. That might seem strikingly inefficient, but it doesn't take into account the amount of damage that those shells prevented. The lives saved and assets protected on defense. Some historians point out that the actual percentage of bombs on target during World War I and conflicts in the 20s and 30s was higher than the bombers of World War II because they didn't have to compete with flak. According to the National Museum of the United States Air Force, on a crucial run towards a German ball bearing factory in 1943, 250 B-17 bombers dropped their entire payloads, but only 10% of those bombs actually landed within 500 feet of the target. You see, flak forced the enemy aircraft to constantly be changing their position, and it harassed the pilots and crew, both by obscuring their vision with these black clouds, but also by striking fear into them, with each ding of shrapnel off the fuselage proving how close you were to death, especially disturbing if one of your allies was shot down next to you. This combination of bad nerves and being constantly forced to alter your attack vector is said to have caused a dramatic decrease in bomber effectiveness. In 1945, General Spatz, the commander of the U.S. Strategic Air Forces, said that flak was, quote, the biggest factor affecting bombing accuracy. And this is backed up by post-war Army Air Force studies, saying that a combined 61.4% of bombing errors could be blamed on the reactions to flak defenses. So even though a kill rate of one aircraft to 12,000 shells does seem wasteful, it's the wrong way to measure flak. It's one of those things that only seems effective if you stop using it once you see how much more damage an unharassed enemy can inflict. And if you consider all of that, how they're used in Star Wars does make some sense. Ahsoka and her V-19 squadron may not be getting hit by the flak bursts, but they might have if they got closer, and we'll never know how much more effective they would have been if there was no flak. Also, deploying vulture droids to intercept is kinda genius. You might think sending your own fighters into your own flak is crazy, but they were disposable. At just 20,000 credits, they cost less than a single Diamond Boron missile, one-third the disposable TIE fighter, one-seventh the V-19, and one-tenth the Delta-7. Just imagine how many credits worth of destruction would have been caused by the 60 concussion missiles in the V-19, 12 being in each of the five starfighters. The distraction and stress caused by the flak, as well as the potential hull, systems, and at least shield damage by it, aided the vultures in finishing them off, providing one of Ahsoka's worst defeats. But to see flak guns at their prime, we have to go to Ryloth and the Second Battle of Geonosis. The CIS have this amazing gun, the J-1 Semi-Autonomous Proton Cannon. Some need to be manually loaded and fired, while other variants are made fully autonomous with the integration of a droid brain. Now this isn't confirmed, but I think this cylinder is a one-size-fits-all shell that can be variable munitions, allowing the J-1 to act like an artillery piece and a flak gun. Because when the Republic attempts to land on Ryloth, we see that some of these hits are devastating to the acclimators, while other shells are exploding far out in front of the invading force, like flak. And here we see how the big and relatively slow LA-80s can be blown apart by this flak. But the worst was in the landing at Point Rain during the Second Battle of Geonosis. As Coyote Mundi puts it, The flak is too heavy! Resulting in several downed gunships. Though brave Y-Wing pilots were able to dive-bomb some of the anti-aircraft batteries. 
This is one of the most chaotic depictions of Flak in Star Wars, really giving you a great sense of the defensive role that it plays. There was all that Flak over Coruscant too, but in the broadside scene, we can see the same rounds being fired out of the mass driver launchers on the invisible hand. It's called a mass driver because it fires a wide range of specialized munitions, with these likely being armored-piercing high explosives. But the lore says that these are the same as those fired by the J-1. And so I think back on Ryloth, he had some guns shooting high explosive shells at the acclimators, and others firing flak. Which instantly makes me think of how this is another similarity with the famous Flak 88. The YouTube channel Military History Visualized is one that I'd recommend to anyone watching this type of video. And he did a video called Flak 88 Accidental Tank Killer, pointing out that the 88 could also fire armored piercing rounds, and this was used to take out tanks at a great distance. I think that's exactly what's going on with the J-1, and the mass drivers on the invisible hand. But definitely let me know what you think of all this down in the comments below. Should we see more flak? Could smart flak ever work with all the ECM tech? Do you think the J-1 had variable munitions? Let me know down in the comments. As for the behind the scenes facts, this gun on the Death Star that looks like an AA gun is a Super Blaster 920 laser cannon which isn't flak, but may have worked like the rapid tracer-firing anti-aircraft machine guns of World War II. And I think Mundi over Geonosis may be the only time that we hear a Star Wars character on screen call it flak. But the existence of flak in Star Wars has been debated since 1977, with the novelization of A New Hope saying that explosive solids were fired from weapons in the Death Star. And in the game Empire at War, we see that they have the all-terrain anti-aircraft, the ATAA. And we got a whole video on that if you want to check it out. Also, there are some flak bursts that appear in the game Rogue Squadron 2 over Yavin, showing that even the secret rebel base had this tech. Now, this video used a lot of resources, all of which you can find in the description. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support this channel without it costing you a thing, or check out our Patreon. Be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, no flak is too thick to stop Moondi, and the Force will be with you, always.